technical talk is ahead of us. Uh, Benoit is a PhD student in Linz. Um, he's researching concurrency in Ruby with Truffle Ruby, but besides Truffle Ruby, he also contributed to many others Ruby implementation like MRI and JRuby. He's the maintainer of Ruby spec, a test suit for the behavior of the Ruby programming language. And with his talk, Parallel and Thread Safe uh, Ruby at High Speed with Truffle Ruby, Benoit Dalloz will show us how to make array and hash thread safe in Ruby, among many other things. Please come on stage. Thank you. Hello. How are you doing? Last day, not too tired. <laughs> Do you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, perfect. Um, so like Monica said, uh, my name is Benoit, and uh, I've been doing a PhD at uh, G GKU, Johannes Kepler University in Linz in Austria, and I'm now actually working at uh, Oracle Labs, uh, still on Truffle Ruby. Uh, so first I have to show you this to tell you that Truffle Ruby is still a research project, so you don't you cannot believe what I say if you want to buy it on an Oracle stock or anything, but I guess that's not the purpose today. Okay, um, so now that I work in Zurich, uh, I've been doing, during a PhD, I'm doing a lot of research about concurrency uh, in Ruby in general. Uh, now I work for Truffle Ruby since almost the beginning, for more than four years. Uh, I'm also the maintainer of RubySpec uh, and an uh, MRI committer. Today I want to talk about two subjects, two topics. Uh, first, I want to give you an introduction to Truffle Ruby and what does it give, what's the advantage. Uh, and then I want to talk about my research, Parallel and Thread Safe Ruby. So Truffle Ruby is a high performance implementation of the Ruby programming language created by Oracle Labs. Um, and to achieve high performance, it uses a just stem compiler, which is called Graal. Uh, it targets full compatibility with uh, the standard Ruby, CRuby or MRI, including C extension. Uh, it's just on GitHub if you want to have a look. Now, there are two ways to run Truffle Ruby. You can either run it on the JVM, on the Java Virtual Machine, and the advantage there is you can interoperate if you already have a Java program or some Java libraries you want to use. And this provides great, great peak performance. But the default way to run it is on a different VM. It's on what we call Substrate VM, uh, which uh, basically it's a ahead of time compilation of Truffle Ruby itself and the JIT to native code. So what we get in the end is just a native executable with the Truffle Ruby interpreter in it and the JIT. And this is much smaller, much more lightweight than the JVM. And it starts much faster, for instance. So on JVM, nothing starts less than half a second, for instance. But here, we can start in 25 milliseconds. Um, and this is all because it's all pre-compiled. All the class are already loaded. Uh, we don't have to do so much initialization work. It also provides faster warm-up, so the time to get to good performance, because we need a just time compiler to compile the important methods, is shorter. Because basically the, the JIT itself, Graal, is already pre-compiled, and everything is already native, so we already have faster interpretation speed. And finally, we also have lower footprint. Uh, because it's not a full JVM, it doesn't need to handle all the Java edge cases. Uh, it can just represent things more efficiently. In the, in the end, we also have great, perf great peak performance because this just comes from the JIT. So this doesn't matter, it's Graal doing its job in both cases. And I want to talk about this Ruby 3x3 project. And I guess you all heard of it by now. Um, and the goal is that CRuby 3 should be three times faster than CRuby 2.0. And the, the way they want to achieve this, and probably the only way you can achieve this, is with a just-in-time compiler. Uh, and MRI just-in-time compiler is called MJIT. The one interesting question is, can Ruby be faster than three times Ruby 2.0? Can Ruby be faster than that? Can we reach like the speed of, I don't know, Java or C or how close can we be to that? And to illustrate that, I want to make a demonstration. I will run OPT Carrot, which is one of the main benchmarks for Ruby 3 times 3. Uh, and it's actually a NES emulator uh, written entirely in Ruby. And it was created by one of the MRI committer. OK. So the first thing we're going to do is try with uh, 2.0, because this is the baseline and what Ruby 3x2 is compared against. 
And to run the program, I just do like this. I just run opt carrot. And here we see it. So this on 2.0, and you see it runs at 34 frames per second. And this is a bit slow, and you can see it also like it's not super reactive. And the reason is like the normal NES, the original NES runs at 60 frames per second. Uh, but here we're like almost twice too slow. So what happens is if you run it on the latest Ruby, uh, latest MRI, which is 261, um, then you can just run it like this. We see it's already faster, around 45 frames per second. We can also run it with MJIT that I just mentioned before by passing the dash dash JIT flag. And there is a bit better. There we reach like over 60 frames per second here, around 70, uh, which is quite nice. But it's not yet fully three times 2.0 or more like two times right now, but it's already great progress. And then what we can also do is running on Truffle Ruby. So for this here, I will use uh, Truffle Ruby in GVM mode uh, because for this benchmark, it runs a bit better because the GVM GC is a bit better. And there what we see is it takes a while to actually get running and get fast. So initially, we have a zero FPS. <laughs> But it will get better, right? So once it starts to learn the program, when it sees what it's doing, what it's worth compiling, and when it has time to compile this, then it starts to be really worth it. <laughs> so this is still, yeah, improving. <laughs> OK, uh, so around 240, maybe a bit more. Yes, 250 occasionally. So that's quite good, and here we're like almost, I don't know, eight times faster than 2.0. And then we start the game, and of course we surprise the JIT, because like, oh, no, you do something completely different. I didn't <laughs> expect that, so I need to relearn the whole program, damn it. <laughs> so it's going to be very, very fast in the beginning, right? But, <laughs> but now it's going to get better. But the interesting is, you see you have a timer on the top right here. But this timer is frame based. So because I'm running much faster, like <laughs> you can see the seconds are like running away very fast. Okay, so we have the result here, like around 210 during the game here, which is uh, still like three times faster than the latest Ruby, so that's a nice result. So yes, we can be faster than uh, three times Ruby 2.0, at least on some programs. And what we saw is a bit this, it's called like a warm-up curve. So in green, we have Truffle Ruby, and in the beginning, it's a bit erratic until it learns the program, basically. But once it's managed to optimize it, then it just go like such higher than everything else. Basically, Truffle Ruby is as fast as the state-of-the-art uh, just time compiler. Like, for instance, it's comparable to V8 on, uh, on quite a few benchmarks. And you can see in the, in the rest, you have like, OK, you can get a bit faster, but basically, it's still this. And uh, I want to try to explain you like why there is such a difference. How can we optimize Ruby to this kind of level? And this is not only on a pity carrot. So here, we look at classic CPU benchmarks. Um, and we see we can get a speed up like around 20, even up to 30 for some benchmark between Ruby 2.3, so it's a little bit old, uh, but there's not so much difference, and Truffle Ruby. We can also run MJIT as its own set of micro benchmark, which is basically like a micro benchmark ready to test their JIT to see if it's effective at what they intended to. Uh, so it's a very small benchmark, it's not very representative, but still it's Quite fun to notice that MJIT itself is about four times faster on this than Ruby 2.0, but we are like 32 times faster. The other areas what Ruffer Ruby is really good at, uh, one instance, for instance, is template rendering, and we hope this uh, brings a significant speed up in Rails as well. 
for instance, we, we measured with the standard ERB, li ERB library, we are about n almost 10 times faster uh, to render a template. And this is due to how we, we represent strings. Uh, it's more kind of a tree-like structure instead of being a flat structure, which means uh, concatenating to a string is a lot faster. There's so other stuff like eval, for instance, with a constant string, is like the same as if you had written the code there. And if you use binding set local variable, it's just as if you set the local variable instead. So this kind of things, like this kind of abstraction, is something we can see through and optimize as good as if they weren't there. Uh, same for like proc lambda and blocks. Uh, in quite a few cases, we can completely remove these overheads and pretend like oh, it's like the code was written in line. Um, and then the big question is, what about Rails, right? And uh, maybe what about Discourse, which is one of the, also the, the big Rails benchmark for b 2 m 3 And we're working on running Discourse now for a while and also other Rails app, uh, trying to look also at smaller ones because Discourse is really huge uh, and hard to get running. And we made some progress. So for instance, Rails 5.2, if you do Rails new, then it almost works out of the box. I think uh, now there's only one patch I need to upstream to Rails. And then it just works, and you can serve, and you have a world with Rails, and no need to do anything. Uh, for this course, we, we got database migration and the asset pipeline to work, uh, but it requires a few hacks that we want to, to address and do it properly. Yeah, the major problem with Rails app is they usually have more than hundreds of dependencies, and many of them are C extension. But we do support C extension, actually, like since the last release. Uh, we now have a completely new way to do C extension, which means most of them actually work out of the box. Well, most of them may be exaggerated, but many of them work out of the box. And so for instance, database driver like SQLite, PG, MySQL2, no, they just work without any effort on our part. Before, we had to do like heavy changes to those to get them working, which of course doesn't scale because there are so many gems. So we really need to support them, just gem install and it has to work. And so we're getting closer to this now. So how can we achieve great performance? And there's actually two concepts here, which is partial evaluation, which I will explain, and the graduate system compiler, like how it optimizes the code. Uh, for the implementation of Truffle Ruby, uh, the core primitive, so like for instance addition or integer, is written in Java, uh, because the whole framework with like Gral and so on is in Java. Um, and the rest of the core library is written in Ruby itself, much like Rubinius. So the first thing that a Ruby virtual machine does when you have some code like this, very simple, is a method foo, just map the an array and triple every element. The first thing any implementation will do is to parse it to an abstract syntax tree that represents the program, but in a way that the, the interpreter can process it. So first here we have like, we start with translation of foo, and what foo does actually does only one thing, it's just called map with a block, and the receiver is this array literal. And then the block itself is another AST, and what it does is just multiply the argument by three. And then finally, we can imagine also like if map is written in Ruby, for instance, it's also its own AST, and what it will do, it will read from the array, build a new array, and call the block for every element. Now in Truffle Ruby, it's very simple, actually. We do, do a slight variation of this, and we already have our interpreter. Um, so the difference is instead of having an AST, a general AST, we have a truffle AST. And the difference there is each of these nodes is actually a Java object. And each of these nodes has an execute method, which tells it how to execute this. So for instance, the multiplication node here, the execution method is going to execute the left side, the right side, and multiply them together. So partial evaluation. So that's how we basically get this, like basically we interpret this tree, and normally interpreting this tree is extremely slow because we don't really know where you're going and you have to handle all different kind of nodes. But with partial evaluation, we can remove that overhead and basically get a just time compiler. Uh, and so what will partial evaluation does is it takes one of these truffle AST of a Ruby method or a Ruby block, and what we will get is a basically a compiler graph, and then we feed this compiler graph to the to Graal, and then we get native code. So basically, it's a way for us to transform this AST to native code. And what we do is we start from the, the, the top node, the root node, and then we inline every uh, method core from there. So let's see how it happens. 
So we start here with our foo AST. And the, execu the execute method of this node foo is just say like, oh, execute the what's inside, right? In this case, there's only one expression, which is this call, so we just execute this one. Now, normally, if child here would be a field, uh, in like a field of a Java object, and you would have to read it from memory. But here with partial evaluation, we know we are compiling foo explicitly and nothing else. So we know this node is actually a constant at compilation time. And what it means is that when we read the child field, it's also a constant. So we can actually traverse the AST for free because we know everything that's already in it. Because it doesn't change essentially most of the time. And if it does change, then we will recompile to take care of that. So we execute the call node. And the call node is going to do some logic to actually call a Ruby method. But the first thing it's going to do is to execute the receiver and the arguments. And the receiver here was this array literal node with one and two. And this one, what it does, is create just a new Ruby array, just all represent arrays. And then it's going to execute each of the value, and each of the value is an integer literal. So there's one and two, and this is just to return the value. Now again, this value is a field, but it's constant at compilation time. So this all goes away, basically. Um, and so what we get in the end is this. So we, we have the, still the way this to call this method that I don't detail, but you see a Ruby array already know exactly what's in it. It's going to be an array of integer with one and two inside it. And we know we call map and nothing else. And we also know we call, we'll call with a given block. Now, we don't do this only for foo, which we should do, but we also do it for the other two, so for map and for block. Uh, and so it's the same process. We just get basically like Java code out of it, or a compiler graph, but it's just a different representation of it. And then we'll put them together. So what happened is uh, partial version also does inlining. So we see like, hey, this foo method, it calls the map method. And actually, it always called the same map method, which is very common. Um, so it might be worth optimizing this. And the same thing, like here we call a block. Actually, it's always the same AST, the same block we are calling. Uh, so we could optimize this too. So what we do is what, what's called inlining. But here it's very simple. It's like, because they call them like this, we just make a bigger AST with everything inside. And so what it means is now, when we finish partial evaluation here, we have everything together. And it's already, uh, very like it's already very expressive about what the code does. So we have our initial array, and then we have a new array of the same size. And for each element, we'll take one of the old element and then multiply it by three. Now, this at this point, partial version finishes, and the uh, JSTM compiler kicks in and starts optimizing this. The first thing it does is that we have this array here, but actually this array is never used after. It's only used here for reading, but it doesn't escape the method. But normally, you would have to allocate it on the heap, and that's not super fast. Uh, so what the optimization does here is like say, oh, this array is never used, so I just don't allocate it at all. I just, whenever we access it, I look already what's inside, because I already know it. And so we place the array here just by the, the representation inside, which is an integer array. And so we here we are reading the array size, but we know it's two, right? It's here, it's two. And uh, when reading from the array, now we read directly from the storage. Then the second optimization uh, is we know that we have an int array, we read from it here, this object is actually going to be always going to be an integer, right? It has to be. So we don't need to check if it's an integer and multiply integers or do something else. We know it's going to be an integer, and so we can just simplify the code here. So the next thing is we have this small loop here, and it does exactly two iterations. And inside the loop, there's not too much code. So actually, we could just like duplicate it for each loop iteration. Then i would become constant. Right? Was, that's what the compiler does. So now, when the new array, the first element, you say, OK, multiply the first element of the old array by 3, and the same for the second element. And then we notice, like, well, actually, the array storage here we only access it here, and we already know like the first element is 1, the second is 2, so we can just remove it, replace it with constant. Done. And finally, we can simplify the multiplication here. Normally, we have to care about overflow, but 1 times 3 obviously is 3 and 6 here, so that's not going to overflow, so we can just do it at compilation time. And we arrange the code, and we got this. 
So now this is very well optimized code for a little problem at hand. <laughs> and so we compile this to this, but it means like if we go back to Ruby code just to get an impression, basically the compiler and Truffle Ruby managed to understand what the human can do with this, like managed to understand the entire logic of this little Ruby code, which seems nothing, but going through map is actually quite quite some work, as we saw. So that's quite cool. And now you can imagine like the GSTM compiler will spit some assembly doing this. It's going to be very simple. It's going to allocate a new array, put a three in it, put a six in it, return, done, instead of doing a lot of work here. Now let's look at uh, the JIT of CRuby, which is called MJIT. Um, there, the, sa the same thing again. So every Ruby VM starts by passing the code to an AST. But then in MRI, it's also transformed to bytecode, just a different representation of the AST, but it's a bit faster to interpret. And then when we call a method many times, MJIT will generate C code. That's how they do JITing. They generate C code and then call a C compiler on it. The C compiler on it will, pro uh, will produce a shared library that you can then load back. So basically, it will produce some native code you can just load back in the Ruby process. And then the next time the function is called, you can just call the compiled version instead, instead of the interpreter. Now we start with the same code, and what MJIT will produce, here it's quite a bit simplified, but to get an ID, is this C code. So we see the array here was one and two, and it's like it's an array in C2. And then we create the, the array from that. So we have some RB method to do this. And then we have a way to, to call a, a method with a block here. And we can imagine that MJIT also compiles the block here also to C. And then that will just look like, okay, if both are integer, we'll just multiply them. If both are float, we multiply them different way. Otherwise, we need to do something else. And that's good. Uh, at that point, the C compiler is called on it, uh, but cannot really do much. So the only difference here is like it's going to figure out that this fixed num, like is three an integer, is going to say, yes, obviously, three is an integer, it's not a float. So this case I can remove, and this case I can remove, because it's always going to be this case. And so that's what it does. But that's the end of it, because the problem is like this map method, the JIT compiler has no idea what it looks like or what it does. So it cannot understand what it does, and it cannot uh, optimize through it. And that's the current limitation of MJIT. Uh, which uh, they might address at some point, but currently it's not there. The problem is this, this map method is actually part of the Ruby binary as just native code. And so the C compiler doesn't have access to that, doesn't see it, doesn't understand what it does. So let's make a small summary of this. Uh, so what I wanted to show you with this example is that the performance of Ruby can be much better. Uh, we can be like almost 10 times faster than Ruby 2.0, at least on some workloads. And Truffle Ruby is an example of this. Um, so the first thing maybe is like, there's no need to rewrite your application in another language for speed. I think like uh, with time, um, Ruby virtual machine will be as fast as basically any other language. Get you an idea like on, on a set of standard benchmark, Truffle Ruby is only two times slower than Java. And Java is a fully static language. You just can't do many of the things you can do in Ruby. Um, one essential optimization is the JIT compiler and its access to the core library. So we need to access to like this map method and everything else because every Ruby program uses a lot of this core library and the JSTM compiler needs to understand them. And it also needs to understand Ruby construct like allocation and this array literal and so on. It needs to have a deeper understanding so it can do optimization that you would be able to do it by yourself but the JIT can do it for you uh, in more cases. Okay, so this was the first part of the talk. So I want to talk about my research a bit. Uh, and that's called Parallel and Thread Safe Ruby. And what I wanted to look at, and what I noticed at the beginning of my PhD, is like dynamic language has poor support for parallelism. Like almost all dynamic language have this problem. It's not just Ruby. And at first you would say like, oh, maybe it's a problem of the, of the design of the language. But not really, like for most of them, actually, it's a problem of the implementation. It's just the implementation uh, didn't do the effort to, to fix this because it's probably difficult to fix. And so I classified basically dynamic language implementation in three categories. The first one is the implementation with a global log. And in this, we find CRuby and CPython. 
And what the global lock means, it means that Ruby code inside the single process will never run in parallel. And that's a bit sad. Like, if you want to scale up, I don't know, your Rails app or whatever it is, you run in Ruby, you might want to use all this multiple core we have on almost every machine right now. Uh, and then, of course, you can work around with multiple processes, but this gives you waste memory and slow communication. So there are other implementations, like, for instance, Jeruby and Rubinius, that will allow you to run Ruby, tr uh, Ruby code in parallel. And here I put them in a bucket called unsafe, and I will explain why. Uh, basically, they break some of the most fundamental Ruby thread safety guarantees. Uh, and the way they do it is because it would be too much overhead for them to really address them, address these guarantees. And finally, we have a third model, which is a share nothing or shared little model. And in there, we have, for instance, JavaScript uh, with their workers, Erlang and processes, but we also have a Ruby 3 guilds in there. So that's a completely different model. Like most problems stem from like, oh, sharing memory and sharing object between different threads. But if you can't do that, then you don't have the problem. Well, that's the way to solve it. The problem is not always very convenient, right? It means you cannot ever pass an object by reference between two different guilds or different actors. Uh, you always need to copy. Um, or you don't need to always use, use immutable data structure, but if you program in Ruby, you know that you enjoy mutation, it's part of the language, and it's part of the expressiveness. So using always deeply mutable data structure is, doesn't look like Ruby anymore. So let me expand a bit on, on the Ruby tree guilds. So the main advantage is a stronger memory model. It gives you more guarantee, because there's no shared memory, basically. Um, the, the disadvantage is what I explained. You cannot pass object and collection between multiple uh, threads or actor or guilds. They have to be deep copied or transfer ownership. So it means like the object was now in this guild and now I move it there and I cannot access it in the first guild anymore but I can access it there. So as long as there is one owner, you can do some optimization. The problem is to actually do this, you still need to copy a big part of the, of the object graph so it's not cheap either. And so that's what one concern I have. Like, how does this scale if you have to copy every object you pass around, right? If it's just a small string, it's probably fine, but if you want to pass a big object graph, you're going to see it performance-wise, for sure. Um, then, of course, this, this guild is a new model. Like, you can't expect trails using threads that they will just work on guilds. No, it's like you need to program this from the start. It's, it's a new programming model, almost like a new language, kind, kind of. You need to express things differently because you cannot pass state the same way. But the other thing is a complementary approach. There are many approaches to concurrency, and there's no single one that wins them all. So this is certainly something new that will bring, I think, interesting things in Ruby. And so some problems are easier to express with this like share nothing or share little uh, programming models, but some of them are also easier to do like more with shared memory. So let's take an example. I was calling earlier Ruby and Ruby is unsafe, and I want to show you why I, categori I categorize them like this. So suppose we have an array here. Then we create 100 threads, and each of these threads will happen 1,000 integer to this array. And of course, I do this concurrently. That's the whole fun. And then we wait for each thread and we print the size of the array. Now, if you run this on CRuby, you get what you expect, which is 100,000. Of course, it doesn't run any of these threads in parallel, but the answer is correct. Now, if you run this on CRuby, you can get two possible answers. And there you get a random number, or you get an exception, which is none of what you want, right? <laughs> Here's the problem. It's like array append is like it's part of the core library. You would expect it to like do the one thing it says in the documentation, which is append one element always, no matter what. If you cannot, I don't know, you don't have enough memory, then crash with that. But that's it. And here, no, basically what it means is like when you get a random number, it means some of the appends were lost. So just here you lost some data. I think that's not very great, right? We don't want to have this in your application, like data disappearing only when there is enough threat to trigger it. And you can also get a concurrency error. So sometimes Jeruby can detect it and then it throws you an exception, which is not great. It will kill the, like, the request or whatever. Uh, like if it could do it without that, then why would they, right? And Ruby knows exactly the same thing, just a different exception. So there's no, no real difference there. Um, 
So the workaround they proposed, that Ruby or Rubinius proposed to this kind of case, say like, oh, you could use a mutex like here, and you could synchronize every time you append to the array. Like, well, but my point was I could do this concurrently, right? So not anymore. <laughs> and synchronizing like this has quite some overhead as well. So this is a way, but there are problems with it. Like, basically, it's very easy to forget to synchronize in one place, and then the entire thing can potentially be racy, and you don't have any guarantee anymore. Uh, of course, you could use also concurrent uh, Ruby and use concurrent array.new. But are you going to check in your program every array allocation if you correctly use concurrent array.new, if it might possibly be used by multiple threads? That's tricky, right? So I want this to be the default. I want it to be like MRI semantics where it's safe by default. Actually, both of the worst around don't allow parallel access to an array on a hash. And actually, to an array, it's counterintuitive, like you say, I have a big array, and then thread one works on this, thread two on this, and thread three on this. They should access everything in parallel. There's no problem there. But it doesn't work with these approaches. You need something smarter and more, more fine-grained. And uh, the biggest point, I already mentioned it, is like, I think like, they are thread in MRI, so if other implementations don't do that, they're just incompatible. From the user point of view, that's the bottom line, right? And so for instance, we had bugs in Bundler and RubyGems, just because like every Ruby program, they assume array append is as well-defined semantics, but tell you, ah, no, bad luck. On this implementation, they don't. Now, of course, Jeremy and Rubin use all this for fun. <laughs> they do this because it would cost them a lot uh, to address this problem. Um, and so my research question is, how can we make collections such as array and hash thread safe, but not have a single thread over it? Because that's the main thing, right? You could just synchronize every operation on array, but then the single trade performance of, say, array append would be 10 times worse, which is not acceptable, right? We don't want that. And more than that, I also want parallel access, at least for arrays, uh, because that's just like a common pattern uh, in concurrent programming. And you thought it was only collection, but actually object have exactly the same problem, because object in Ruby, you can add or remove instance variable at any time. So it's basically a specialized hash map, but it has the same capacity as that. Same possibilities. The problem is like we can have potentially thousands of fields on the same object, so we never know how much we need to allocate for it. So we might need to grow the storage for this field and this value in the object. And if you do this concurrently, then it's gonna it's gonna get fun. Uh, so here is an example. I won't go into too much details, but you create an object at the beginning, and then we have two threads. And the first thread is gonna assign one to field A. We suppose we have some attribute accessors, and then update it to two. And the second thread is going to assign B. And we wait for both threads, and it's possible that when you print the value of A, you get 1, which means the update to 2 was entirely lost, like the, the lost append. It's a kind of similar case. And this can happen, for instance, if the storage initially has a capacity of 1, then this thread, and it tries to add B, it says, like, oh, I need to resize it to allocate a bigger buffer, then assign the new value, then assign the new storage to the object. But if it is done concurrently without synchronization with the first thread, then this update is lost. This update is done on the previous version of the storage and not this new version of the storage. And this actually happened under Rubinius. Uh, do Ruby synchronized for this, so they fixed this case, uh, but Rubinius doesn't. So let's get to my idea, uh, to what I did. This, the idea was quite simple. It's like, oh, let's synchronize only if we need it. And, but let's do an approximation because that's hard to know where do we need it. So. I synchronize only if multiple threads can reach an object. If I create an array like this, and then I do some operation on it, but it does, I never put it in something global, I never share it with other threads, then I don't need synchronization because it cannot be accessed concurrently. And then only the other ones, like the objects that are shared in global variable and so on, they have synchronization. So what I do is I categorize object and collection two category. What I call local, so like kind of thread local, and then the shared, the one that needs synchronization. Initially, here, everything is white, everything is local. But if I get a pointer, uh, if I get a reference to a queue from the second thread, then suddenly this queue is accessible by multiple threads, so it needs synchronization. And not only the queue, but everything reachable from it, because now the message is accessible through the queue. Like, thread two could poop the, uh, pop the message out of the queue and access it concurrently. So everything there, all this blue object here, will become synchronized at that point. And so 
What we need to do to track this at runtime is actually quite simple. Whenever you write something in a shared object on a shared collection, you make it shared as well. So I write something in a shared object field, then I will share this, this, and this, right? And then for the array, then I will share the element in it. For the hash, I will share both the key and the value. And what we notice with this is like, this is an easy way to preserve single thread performance. So here's a bunch of classic benchmark. And in red, we have like Truffle Ruby before my work, and in green after my work, so no objects are safe. And we see there's basically no difference between red and green. On the other hand, if you would synchronize on every write, like JRuby does, for instance, there's quite some overhead because you synchronize on every object write, even those that are not shared concurrently. Then we do the same for collection. Again, same thing, before and after, we see there's no difference. Because these are single-traded benchmarks. Of course, they don't access uh, object concurrently, and there is no overhead. Okay, now I'm going to have to be a bit faster. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, state of the art virtual machine represents arrays uh, more in a more complicated way than you might Im imagine. For instance, V8 used this, and like most of the fast VM would. Basically, they represent the array and they speci specialize it to what it contains. Oops. Yes. Um, and so initially, when you create an empty array, then it uses this empty strategy, it's just like this way of representing it. But then when you put an integer into it, it's going to migrate to an int array. And when you put an object, it goes to the object array. The object array is the most general one, but it's also the most inefficient one, because it takes a lot of space, memory, and you have also an extra indirection. If like, you have an array only of integer, then each element only takes four bytes, which is like half of what it would take normally, and it's also much faster to access. The uh, goal for my thread safe array is I want them all operation to be thread safe. Basically, I have kind of the same semantic as MRI as much as possible. And I want to preserve this important optimization uh, because that's really like a key for good performance. And then I also want this parallel read and write I already mentioned earlier. So how do I do this? I make this more complex. I add a new dimension, which I call like concurrent strategies. And basically, I have now this new strategy that will wrap like a representation strategy, a storage strategy. And I have two of them, because actually I want to, to specialize on two different keys. Like, if I have a large array, but I don't resize it all the time, but like multiple threads can then access it very easily, then I want this to be very low overhead, and so I have this shared fixed storage that does just this. So this one doesn't, su it supports like access within bounds of the array, but it doesn't support resizing, appending, deleting from the middle or anything. If you do any of these, then we go to the most general one, which is this shared dynamic storage. And it means there I will use a lock every time I access the array, because there it becomes too complicated. There is no other way to do it properly. Now what we see here is like when we have read operation and write operation, uh, from one to 44 threads, we see that first it scales very well. And so here in light blue, we have local, so that like the array are reachable only by one thread. And in dark blue, we have this uh, fixed storage, it actually has the same performance. This one doesn't need to synchronize because it assumes like the array doesn't change the storage, then it doesn't need to do extra synchronization. But on the other hand here, we have a bunch of different logs and we see like, oh, that least three times slower before even doing anything, right? And so here we have like the simple reentrant log, which is like kind of what the MRI Agile would do. It just doesn't scale, end of it. And here you have a kind of a read-write log in uh, dark green here, which scales on read, but not on write because writes are sequential. Then we have a more fancy lock, which is called the layout lock, and a variant, the lightweight layout lock, which actually scale for read and write, but they don't scale when you resize the array. And so those here we see have, have better performance. Then we run like bigger benchmark, because this is obviously some kind of micro benchmark. We run what is called uh, the NASA or NASA parallel benchmark. And it's a set of old benchmarks actually written in Fortran ages ago. But that's still important in the research community. Like this is like typical parallel uh, programming. Uh, and so it does translate it from Fortran to Java and also to Ruby. So we can run it on Ruby. And we can run it on Truffle Ruby here, which is the unsafe variant, and also on the thread safe variant here, which are called concurrent strategies. What we see in general is like, again, there's not much difference between the unsafe and the same version. But also we scale nearly as good as Java and Fortran. Now, this is only scalability, it's not raw speed. 
Uh, but still, it shows like in Ruby you can scale as good as basically the state of the art. So my conclusion is this. I already said like the performance of Ruby can be much better, and we're getting there. And Truffle Ruby is an example, and we're working hard on it. Uh, we can also have parallelism in Ruby and thread safety, uh, with, uh, and this basically at no cost or very lo little overhead. So we can have no single threaded overhead, and we can still have like this fast access even when it's used concurrently. Um, so in the end, what we can do is we can execute Ruby code in parallel, and we have most of the guarantees of the GIL of MRI while still being able to scale and run it in parallel. So if you want to try Truffle Ruby, it's, not, it's now uh, integrated entirely with Ruby Manager and Installer, so you can use whatever you like. Um, and Truffle Ruby is actually part of a bigger project, which is called GraalVM. Uh, and uh, the first release of GraalVM, the follow-up source release of GraalVM was uh, last year. And it's actually an open source uh, community edition and enterprise edition. The reason is like there's a lot of research behind it, so I need some way to, to finance it. Uh, this is more targeted, like bigger enterprise to have support and so on, for instance. Now in GraalVM, we don't only have Truffle Ruby, but we also have other language. So we have a JavaScript engine, uh, also full Node.js support. We also support R and Python, and also LLVM bitcode, which means we also support C, C++, and REST. All of this in a single VM, which means if you interact closely with this language, you can be much faster because everything the same process in the same VM, they can be optimized together. So suppose you have a Ruby method that calls on Python for machine learning. You can actually optimize through it. The JIT can see through it, inline through it, and really optimize this very well. We also have a built-in tooling. So for instance, you have a CPU sampler, uh, and tracer, and also memory profiler, and a debugger. All of this included for all this language. It's just language agnostic. I don't need to install any gem or anything. It's just there. You just pass the command line flag, and that's it. You have it. Uh, so that's it. Uh, that's the end of my talk. I hope you enjoyed it. And uh, if you have any question, and we have time, I don't know. <laughs> Otherwise, you can just catch me in the corridor. Thank you. Thank you, Benoit. That's for you. Thank you. Thank you. And no, we won't have time. <laughs>